back in the, in the mid 90s, I, I had to grapple with a couple of new concepts that I'd never heard of before and which were just beginning to break through into the public domain. One was the, a thing called the SOI, otherwise known as the Southern Oscillation Index. And the other was that, uh, that twin delight that comes to us across the Pacific called La Nina or El Nino. Since then, we've become incredibly familiar with these particular climatic phenomena. But I really wish I'd known David Caroli back then. Not only because he's a world-renowned climate scientist, lead author of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the fourth assessment report, which of course picked up the Nobel Prize, but also because he's an exceptional communicator. And as many of you would understand, finding people who can explain in accessible terms to people like us the complexities and the consequences of what we're witnessing in the world around us is, uh, is a very rare trait. So we are very delighted to have David Caroli with us this evening. He's Professor of Earth Sciences at Melbourne University. And he's taking a look tonight at respect for the common good. One of the really interesting things is that the way that science is portrayed in the media is as if there is a debate on a range of scientific issues. In fact, if you discuss genetically modified organisms, if you discuss vaccinations and their benefit in the public, or if you discuss climate science, there appears to be a robust debate in the media. However, in terms of climate science at least, there is a very strong majority, which is actually not communicated in the media, that in terms of active publishing climate scientists, the majority is about 97% agree with the conclusions of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. That climate change is happening, that most of the observed warming that we see over the last 50 years is primarily due to human activity, and that it's going to get substantially worse in our lifetimes. If you read some of the media, or if you listen to some commentators, you'll get a very different perspective. The remarkable thing that, in fact, in the Australian Parliament, both the opposition and the government, all political parties accept those conclusions. The debate in Australian Parliament is, what do you do about those conclusions? What do you do about trying to determine how to avoid or minimise dangerous climate change? Uncertainty in science means the precise nature or magnitude of the result is uncertain. We actually have high confidence about many different aspects of climate change. But some of them, when we're talking about climate change, means that we have to balance both beneficial changes and adverse changes. And how do you balance those in a diverse world where some people will benefit and some people will have adverse impacts? There is no easy way to do that. The precautionary principle is an understanding that we should take precautions to prevent uncertain changes when those changes may have substantially adverse impacts. We need to avoid the worst risks. The precautionary principle has been used by some people to argue we shouldn't do anything until we're absolutely certain. Those are two very different things and the true use of the precautionary principle is that we should seek to act now, even given uncertainty, in case the worst risks happen. Given that the climate is warming, given that scientists have assessed all the data and say that the climate is going to warm substantially, then if we look at the bottom panel, we have two choices. A choice of business as usual emissions which leads us to a climate with 
five degrees or more of global warming above pre-industrial levels, four degrees or more warming above the present day. And if we make a switch in time, we have a choice. That blue band in the bottom panel, temperature projections which the countries around the world agreed to in Copenhagen in 2009 to limit global warming to only two degrees above pre-industrial levels. Scientists can tell us what we need to do to achieve that, and that's in the upper panel, not following the red trajectory, but following the other trajectory, which is greenhouse gas emissions in the future. We need to turn around our profligate increasing emissions of carbon dioxide and reduce emissions. We have to reduce emissions by about 80% globally by 2050. And then we have to go to zero emissions in the lifetime of younger people in the audience. Zero emissions means that a fossil fuel-based economy has a limited lifetime. Australia has the highest per capita emissions in the world. We need to take the biggest reductions. At the start of 2011, the government established the Australian Climate Commission and it produced a report called The Critical Decade, which in fact was endorsed by all political parties. Its key conclusion is that global warming is already happening. There is no reasonable doubt. And the main cause is the increase in greenhouse gases due to human activity. And the only place where you can find unreasonable doubts is in some of the mass media, like the Herald Sun in Victoria and like the Australian, who have actively campaigned against the carbon pricing mechanism. They've said that it will destroy the economy. They've said that it won't work. The really interesting thing is that the introduction of the carbon price has directly led to reductions in Australian emissions from electricity use already. And that the increase in consumer price index was half what the Treasury predicted. So it is working. It isn't enough. We need more in terms of greenhouse gas emission reductions. We need at least 80% emission reductions in Australia or more. This decade is the critical decade. And if we are to make a switch in time, if we are to respect the science, then we need to, yes, have a public discussion. We need to look at all the evidence, but then we need to decide whether it's the opinions of experts like Andrew Bolt, or the opinions of experts like CSIRO, or the Bureau of Meteorology, or the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, who provide us with more useful information. There are a range of interest groups in Australia who have massive investments in fossil fuel technologies. We need to make a decision as a community about which underutilised resource we want to use. We have a massive underutilised renewable energy resource in Australia. Australia re receives more sunlight than any other country in the world. But we don't utilise it. Australia has a greater wind power potential than any other country in the world. Australia has a greater wave power potential than any other country in the world. And yet, there is an argument about using the underutilised fossil fuel resource about whether we should use that or leave it buried in the ground. Given the adverse impacts from using the fossil fuels, I would argue we need to leave them buried in the ground and make use of other <laughs> underutilised 
renewable energy resources. We need a switch in time and we need to respect the science. Thank you.